But when I came back to England in 1976, after three and a half years in Australia, the National Front had suddenly become, you know, in parts of East London and Tower Hamlets were getting 19% of the votes. There was a real chance that pop music as it arrived and um, youth culture could have moved easily to the right and become nihilistic and racist and fascist. That fight that we had wasn't just, it, it was very much a fight with music you know, and dream reggae and punk together in particular. Um, and it was ironic that skinheads were the first white people to like reggae, even though they were racist. And it, and it was just one of the mad contradictions about it. You know, they, they really were into Scar in particular, um, and Bluebeat. And it's suddenly, so there's, they were quite an important constituency. And as we always said in Rock Against Racism, racism is a white problem, in the sense it's a problem that we have to solve. Well, I mean, white people have to be changed. They've got to change their heads and, and, and the arguments. Uh, and so we had to address those skinheads. We couldn't ignore them. We couldn't just, just dismiss them and get rid of them. We had to engage with the debate. That's why I got involved in the Met photographer called Red Saunders with Rock Against Racism. And so most of these pictures were taken really for a magazine which we produced called Temporary Gordon. I was very keen to do pictures and portraits of people who really Ra was addressing. The photography on the left at that particular time was utterly dominated by organisations like Report, who were run by a man called Simon Gutman. Simon Gutman used to be a picture editor and picture post. He had taken that sort of Cartier-Bresson idea of the decisive moment as a sort of act of faith, a, a treatise, if you know what I mean. It was, it was um, something by which he was obsessed. His idea, his idea of a great photograph was a demonstration with somebody with a mouth up shouting the fist in their air. And I was all totally opposed to this like, and I thought I said this thing has no subtlety so like there's no understanding about people and the complexity and, and relationships between people and uh, they don't tell you anything all they, all they tell you about is the photographer not about what's actually happening so many of those photographers took the picture before they even got there he didn't like me at all I mean not on a personal level but he didn't like my work at all he thought it would you know he'd say no these are posed I don't like you know look at a picture like this and he said yes they're looking straight at the camera they're posed and I go yes they are but that doesn't mean it's not a real photograph setting people up and people is, is, is so much a part of the history of photography. So most of these were, like certainly my visits to Northern Ireland, for example, were always part of pictures for temporary hoarding. And the ones, the raw gigs were also used for temporary And a bit, how can I describe it? I don't think at that time that I realized that I was actually putting together a narrative. I it was just that I always carried my cameras and took photographs all the time. It was only Really, Carol tells you that Carol Tulloch, who's actually my wife, who kept saying to me, "Look, this is, this, we should put, you should put these together. They're really fantastic. I like these." And, um, and, and I said, "Look, there's all sorts of summer portraits, summer gig shots." And she said, "But it's a story. This is a whole um, collection." So, really, the, at the time, you were too close to it to actually think of them as being that's of any significance. It was something I was involved with, and we were living rather than just. I wasn't an outsider, it was a sort of insider's view. And it, it, the National Front organised this thing called the Mugging March in Lewisham. That was the first time we went along with Rock Against Racism. We, we, had the, we made these lollipops with the Ra logo, which Dave King designed. That was the big event which, um, which kicked off, in a way, Rock Against Racism. That's Clifton Rise in Lewisham. That's dark as hell on the, um, on the megaphone. That was 70, 1977. Those um, girls attacked the National Front March and they've got one of the um, honour guard Union Jacks with its gold braid around the edge and they, that's what she's holding up. Is they actually tore it up and she's holding it up in triumph. That was the first time in mainland Britain that bright shields had ever been used. Um, and that was literally the first sight of them. They just suddenly got them out of this van and, start, and, and did this thing across the road. None of us had ever, I mean I had because I'd been to Northern Ireland. But it's, it was an incredible battle, that battle that day, and it really, I mean, um, there was a lot of fighting, a lot of, um, there were tear gra and there were um, flares, what with people were throwing at the police. I remember that because I fell over, got a charge to the horses. I remember getting back just feeling absolutely worn out, because I'd run with two Nikons and bag of lenses for an entire day chase, being chased by police, and so that was quite an, a very important day in the development of the ideas of rock against racism. And, after that, we got so many people contacted us saying, look, we want to put our two bobs with him. We want to get involved in this. We think it's a great idea. And um, 
it really took off from then. It's a, it's a wonderful story in a way, what happened that day of um, 29th of April, 1978. We decided we wanted to put on a, a big concert and we contacted the Anti-Nazi League and, um, and suggested we did a joint thing because they had much more financial support and, um, and Tom Robinson in particular and um, Steel Pulse both said they'd do it. The Anti-Nazi League lived in a slightly different world than we did in the sense that said, oh yeah, they were very um, much more political in the sense of orthodox but political. And they said, yes, we'll get a lorry and do it on the back of a lorry. And we went, no, no, we've got, we've got this idea. We want to build a stage and do a, a sort of Woodstock, you know, to do a big mm. outdoor concert. Um, and we managed to get help from, I mean, we rang everybody we knew. We called in sort of favours from people like Gerard Nankovic. And he knew everybody in the music business. And he put us in touch with The Who and lent us a PA system. Um, Pete Townsend, um, Polystyrene got involved. She said she wanted to do it. And then, Shortly before the carnival, um, it must be, after we put posters up everywhere, um, about two weeks, the Clash suddenly ran up. Bernie Rhodes, who was the manager of the Clash, ran up and said, look, I want to have a meeting with you. And we had this meeting with the Clash, and they said they wanted to do it. What we decided to do was that, based really, that we called it carnival, because we wanted it to be like carnival, and we hired, I think we had 12 trucks with bands on trucks, and we said what we wanted to do was to march from Trafalgar Square to Victoria Park, which is seven miles. And everybody said, you're completely bonkers. Nobody will march from Father Square. It's, it's too far. And we said, yes, we will, because we'll make it a carnival. We'll make it into, we'll just take over the whole street. We'll do ridiculous things like have stilt men and clowns. And Virgin gave us, I think it was 100,000 whistles. No, that's the whistles. And we, we, it, we wanted to make it into something quite different. It wasn't going to be a sort of dour political demonstration. It was meant to be a festival um, against the National Front and against racism.